And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And that you may be the better understand these words, you must know that whatsoever God threatened against old Eli in the second and third chapters because he did not restrain his wicked sons from their lewd courses is here executed in this chapter and therefore we read there were 4,000 Israelites slain by the Philistines and the elders of Israel met together to consult how to repair this great loss and they confess it was the Lord that had smitten them for they say wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines and they conclude the way to repair this their loss it was to fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh and carry it into the battle whereupon they appointed Hophni and Phinehas to fetch it and whereby they imagined that the presence of the ark would save them from ruin but herein they were terribly mistaken for this judgment befell not because the ark was not in the camp but because their sin was in the camp the Ark of the Covenant would not preserve those that had broken covenant with God, and therefore there was a, a great slaughter of the Israelites, there, and there were slain 30,000 men, and Hophni and Phinehas were slain, and the Ark itself was taken prisoner. Well, what was old Eli doing? He was 98 years old and was not able to go to the battle, but sits upon a seat by the wayside near the battle, and there he sits, thinking what shall become of the ark. And lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside, watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. For fear, lest the ark should be taken. He, he was not troubled what should become of his two sons, or what should become of the people of Israel, but what should become of the ark of God. In the words, there are three parts. First, old Eli's solicitousness for the ark and second old Eli's heart trembling for fear of the ark and third old Eli's preferring the safety of the ark before the safety of his two sons wife and children he sat upon a seat by the wayside watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God but what was the ark of God why should old Eli's heart tremble for fear of the ark I answer this ark was the holiest of all the things of God it was so holy that it made every place holy where it came 2nd Chronicles 8 11 and Solomon brought up the daughter of Pharaoh out of the city of David into the house that he had built for her and said for he said my wife shall not dwell in the house of David king of Israel because the places are holy whereunto the ark of the Lord hath come. This ark was the dwelling place of God. It was the habitation of God. Psalm uh, 99, 1, The Lord reigneth, he sitteth between the cherubims. Now these cherubims were placed over the ark. It was the, it was the speaking place of God. He met the people there, and there he gave an answer to them. In Exodus 25, 21, and 22. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, and there will I meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from above the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things I shall give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. This ark was God's footstool and all the people of God worship him before the footstool of God Psalm 99.5 Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool for he is holy the ark it was the glory and the strength of Israel Psalm 78.61 and he delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into his enemies hands and it was the terror of the enemies of God and therefore when the ark came into the battle 
The Philistines were afraid and said, Woe unto us, for God has come down into the camp. And indeed, this ark was called Jehovah. Numbers 10.35 And it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. In a word, the ark was a pledge and a visible symptom of God's gracious presence with his people. As long as the ark was saved, they were saved. And when the ark was with them, then God's presence was with them. When the ark was gone, God was gone. His comforting presence, his protecting presence, and his preserving presence. And therefore, no wonder that this good old man sat watching here for fear of the ark. I call him good old man. Many are of opinion that he was not good because he suffered his sons to be wicked. And indeed, his fault was great. But surely he was a good man. And I have two reasons to prove it. First, in that he took the punishment of his iniquity so patiently. It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth to him good, says Eli. And secondly, he was a good man, as appears by the text, his solicitousness for the ark. He sat trembling for fear of the ark. Now this ark was a type of three things. First, it was a type of Jesus Christ. For God spake from the ark, so God speaks to us by Christ. Secondly, it was a type of the church of Christ. Whereas the ark was the preserver of the two tables of the law, so the church of Christ is the preservative of the scriptures. And thirdly, the ark was a type of the ordinances of Christ. For as God did com- uh, communicate himself by the ark, so God by his ordinances communicates his counsels, comforts, and grace unto his people. The ordinances of Christ, they are the oraculum by which he conveys himself unto his people. Thus I have showed you what the ark was. I shall gather two observations from the words. First, that when the ark of God is in danger of being lost, the people of God have thoughtful heads and trembling hearts. Second, that a true child of God is more troubled and more solicitous what shall become of the ark than what shall become of wife and children or estate. I shall begin with the first doctrine, that when the ark of God is in danger of being lost, the people of God have thoughtful heads and trembling hearts. Or, if I may put this doctrine in a gospel dress, take it this, that when the gospel is in danger of losing, when gospel ordinances are in danger of being lost, and gospel ministers in danger of losing, that then the people of God have trembling heads and careful and solicitous hearts about it. Mark what I say. I say not when the ark is lost, for that was death to old Eli. That broke his neck, and it cost the life of Eli's daughter-in-law. When the ark of God was taken, she took no comfort in her child, though a man-child, she regarded it not, for the glory is departed from Israel. The ark of God is taken. I say not when the ark of God is lost, but I say when it is in danger of losing. When the gospel is in danger, the ministers of the gospel in danger, and the ordinances in danger to be lost. Then the people of God have trembling hearts and careful heads. When God threatened the Israelites that he would not go with them, they were troubled for the loss of God's presence and would not put on their ornaments. Exodus 33, 3. I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on his ornaments. 1 Samuel 7, 2, And it came to pass, while the ark abode in kiriath Jerem, that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord, that is, after the presence of God speaking from the ark. 2 Samuel eleven ten, David would have had Uriah to have gone down to his house and made merry, 
And Uriah said unto David, The ark, and Israel, and Judah, abide in tents. And my lord Joab, and the servants of my lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat, and to drink, and to lie with my wife? As thou livest, and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. 1 Kings 19.10 And Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Thus you see, when the ark is in danger, the people of God mourn and are sorrowful. And there be four reasons why the people of God are so much troubled when the ark of God is in danger. First reason, because of the great love they bear to the ark of God. As God loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Psalm 87.2 So the people of God love the ordinances of God and the faithful ministers of Christ. Psalm 26, eight, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Psalm 27.4 One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now love stirreth up the affections. As young Croesus Though he were dumb, yet seeing his father like to be killed, cried out, Do not kill my father. Such is the love of the saints of God to the ark, that they cannot be silent. They cannot but tremble when they see the ark in danger. And for Zion's sake, they cannot hold their peace. And they cannot be silent until the Lord make the righteousness thereof go out like brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. The people of God are troubled at this because of the interest they have in the ark of God. Now interest stirreth up affection, as when another man's house is on fire, as you had a lamentable and sad providence this last week, and it is not to be forgotten, how suddenly, in all our feastings, may God dash all our mirth. Now consider how were they affected that had an interest in those that were burned. So the people of God have an interest in the ark. God is the haven of a child of God, the portion and inheritance of a child of God. And when God begins to forsake them, they cannot but be afflicted and troubled. The ordinances of God are the jewels of a Christian and the treasure of a Christian. And the loss of them cannot but trouble them. And Jesus Christ is the joy of a Christian. And therefore, when Christ is departing, they cannot but be much afflicted at it. Third, the people of God are much troubled when the ark is in danger because of the mischiefs that come upon a nation when the ark of God is lost. Woe be to that nation when the ark is gone. The heathens had the image of Apollo and they conceived that as long as that image was present among them, they could never be worsted but be preserved. And the Romans had a buckler upon which they had a tradition that as long as their buckler was preserved, Rome could not be taken. Shall I give a hint and set it out a little in five particulars? First, when when the Ark of God is taken, then the ways of Zion mourn and none can come to the solemn assemblies. It, it, it was the complaint of the church in Lamentations 1.4 that is a matter of sadness. Second, when the ark of God is taken, then the ministers of Christ are driven into corners. And this is a matter of heart trembling. Third, when the ark of God is taken, then the souls of many are in danger. When the gospel is gone, your souls are in hazard. There is cause of sadness. Four, then do the enemies of God blaspheme and are ready to say, Where is your God? Then do the enemies of God triumph. Psalm 42.10 As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? 
5 then is Jesus Christ trampled underfoot and the ordinance of God defiled and trampled on and then blasphemy and atheism come in like an armed man the people of God must needs tremble when the ark is in danger because of the, their accessoriness to the losing of the ark and this was that which made old Eli so much troubled because he knew it was for his sin that God suffered the ark to be taken he knew that his not punishing his two sons was one cause of that great slaughter of the people of Israel the people of Israel met with all and that made him tremble there is no person here in this congregation but his heart will tell him he hath contributed something towards the loss of the ark none of us so holy but our consciences must accuse us we have done something that might cause God to take the ark from us and therefore Mr. Bradford that blessed martyr said in his prayer Lord it was for my unthankfulness for the gospel and that brought him popery in Queen Mary's days and my unfruitfulness under the gospel that was the cause of the untimely death of King Edward VI and those that fled in Queen Mary's day sadly complained that they were the cause of God's taking away the gospel from England O oh, beloved it is for thy sin and my sin that the ark of God is in danger and therefore the Lord gave us trembling solicitous hearts what shall become of the ark I come now to application first use if this be the property of a true child of God to be solicitous when the ark of God is in danger and to have such a trembling heart for fear of the ark then this is a certain sign there are but few that are the children of God in truth oh where is the man and where is the woman that like old Eli sits watching and trembling for fear of the ark and what will appear by these reasons first in reference to the many sins in this nation for let me tell you there is not one sin for which God ever took away the ark from any people but it is to be found in England did the church of Ephesus lose the candlestick because they had lost their first love and have not we lost our first love to the gospel and to the ordinances and did the church of Laodicea lose the candlestick because of lukewarmness and are not we lukewarm did the people of Israel as here in the text lose the ark because they abhorred the offerings of God and do you not do so as well are not the sins of Israel among us the sins of Germany and the sins of all other nations about us and can any man here before God this day in this congregation that considers the great unthankfulness of this nation and the great profaneness and wickedness of this nation that they may conclude the ark is in danger and God may justly take the ark from us I might tell you of the drunkenness adultery covetousness injustice and uncharitableness etc that doth abound among us and I might tell you of sanctuary sins profanation of Sabbath and sacraments our unthankfulness and unfruitfulness and unworthy walking under the gospel and you of this place God may very well take the ark even from you and indeed it was the great interest I had in you the which while I live I shall ever own that and that great affection and respect I have to you that I would not send you home this day without a sermon and let you go without a blessing now can any of you in this parish and in this congregation can any of you say God may not justly take the gospel from you secondly shall I add the discontents and divisions of a nation as Christ saith a nation divided against itself cannot stand but I leave these things to your considerations I believe there is none here but will confess the ark of God is in danger to be lost but now where are our Eli's to sit watching and trembling for fear of the ark where is Phineas his wife that would not be comforted because the ark of God was taken 
Where are our Moseses, our Elijahs, our Uriahs? Where are they that lay to heart the dangers of the ark? You complain of taxes, decay of trading, of this civil burden and that civil burden, but where is the man or the woman that complains of this misery, the loss of the ark? Most of you are like Gallio. He cared not for these things. If it had been a civil matter, then he would have meddled with it. But for religion, he cared not for that. Every man is troubled about meum and tuum, about civil concernments. But who lays to heart? Who regards what shall become of religion? There is a strange kind of indifferency and lukewarmness upon most people's spirits. So they have their trading go on and their civil burdens removed. They care not what becomes of the ark. There is a text of scripture. I shall not spend much time in opening it, but I would have you well consider it. Hosea 7.9 Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. Shall I say gray hairs are upon the gospel? I come not hither to prophesy. I say not the gospel is dying, but... I say it hath gray hairs, for you have had the gospel a hundred years and above, and therefore it is in its old age. And I dare challenge any scholar to show me an example of any nation that hath enjoyed the gospel for a hundred years together. Now that gray hairs is to a hundred years, is no wonder. Well, gray hairs are here and there, and yet no man layeth it to heart. Now, shall I spend time to show you what a great sin it is not to be affected with the danger that the ark of God is in. Consider but three particulars. First, it is a sign you do not love the gospel. If you had any love to it, you would be troubled more for the danger of the ark than for any outward danger whatsoever. Secondly, it is a sign you have no interest in the gospel, for interest will stir up your affections. It is a sign you are not concerned in the gospel, for if you were concerned in it, you would be affected with it as those that were interested in those persons that were in that lamentable fire last week it is impossible but they should be affected so it is a sign you have no interest in God and Christ if your hearts do not tremble for the fear of the loss of the ark but thirdly there is a curse of God pronounced against all those that do not lay to heart the afflictions of Joseph Amos 6 1 to 6 Woe be to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria. Ye that put far away the evil day that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches that eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall that chant to the sound sound of the vial and invent to themselves instruments of music that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments but they are not grieved for the afflictions of Joseph. Woe be to you that enjoy your fullness of outward things and make merry therewith and never consider the afflictions of God's people and the danger of the ark. The second use for exhortation to beseech you all that God by a providence hath so unexpectedly brought this day to hear me uh, that and there may be a good providence in it possibly I may do good therein I say let me beseech you all to declare you are the people of God in deed and in truth by following the example of old Eli to be very solicitous of the ark of God and let me exhort you to five particulars first let me persuade you to believe that the gospel is not entailed upon England England hath no letters patent of the gospel the gospel is removable God took away the ark and forsook Shiloh and he did not only take away the ark but the temple also. He unchurched the Jews. He unchurched the seven churches of Asia and we know not how soon he may unchurch us. I know no warrant we have to think that we shall have the gospel another hundred years. God knows how to remove this candlestick but not to destroy it. God doth often remove the church but doth not destroy it. God removed his church out of the east as the Greek churches were famous churches 
but God removed them and now the Turk overspreads that country. Secondly, I would persuade you that England's Ark is in danger to be lost. Were it not only for the sins of England, those prodigious iniquities among us, and that strange unheard of ingratitude that is in the land, but I will say no more of that because I would speak nothing but what becomes a sober minister of the gospel. Thirdly, I would persuade you, and oh, that I could raise you up to old Eli's practice. He sat watching, for his heart trembled for fear of the ark. He had a thoughtful head and an aching heart for the ark of God that was in great danger. And that I might move you to this, consider what a sad condition we are in if the ark be taken. What will your estate do you good? Or what will your concernments do you good if the gospel be gone? Wherein doth England exceed other places? There is more wealth in Turkey than in England. And the heathen nations have more of the glory of the world than any Christian king hath. What is the glory of England? What is the glory of Christianity but the gospel? If the gospel be gone, our glory is gone. Pray remember Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas. She hearkened not, though a man-child was born, and would receive no comfort, but called his name Ichabod, for the glory is departed from Israel. The ark of God is taken. Oh, when the glory is gone, who would desire to live? I am loath to tell you the story of Chrysostom. He was but one man, but yet when he was banished Constantinople, Constantinople the people all petitioned for him and said they could as well lose the sun out of the firmament as lose Chrysostom from among them fourthly let me persuade you not to mourn immoderately neither be discouraged I would willingly speak something to comfort you before I leave you I know not by what strange providence I came here this day and the Lord knows when I shall speak to you again Therefore, I would not send you home comfortless. O oh, therefore, mourn not as without hope, for I have four arguments to persuade me that the ark of God will not be lost, though it be in danger of losing. First, because God hath done great things already for this nation, and I argue like Manoah's wife, surely if God hath intended to destroy us, he would not have done what he had done for us. He that hath done so much for us will not now forsake us. And therefore, though our hearts tremble, yet let them not sink within us. Secondly, I argue from the abundance of praying people that are in this nation. There are many that night and day pray unto God that the ark may not be taken. And let me assure you, God will never forsake a praying and reforming people. When God intends to destroy a nation and take away the ark, He takes away the spirit of prayer. But where God gives you the spirit of prayer, there God will continue the ark. You all know that if there had been but ten good men in those five cities, God would have spared them. We have many hundreds that fear God in this nation that do not give God rest, but night and day pray unto God for this land. And who knows, but for their sakes God will spare the ark. Thirdly, another ground of comfort is this, that God hath hitherto dealt with England not by way of rule, but way of prerogative. We have had unchurching sins all the reign of Queen Elizabeth and of King James, and the godly ministers have been threatened, ruined from year to year. But God hath hitherto saved England by way of prerogative. God hath spared us because he will spare us. According to that text, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. God will not be tied to his own rule, and who knoweth, but God will deliver us. Fourthly, another ground of comfort is that God is now pouring out his vials upon Antichrist, and all this shall end in the ruin of Antichrist. God is pouring forth his vials upon the throne of the beast, And all these transactions shall end in the ruin of the Antichrist. Though some drops of these vials may light upon the Reformed churches and they may smart for a while, and God may severely punish them, yet 
it will be but for a little while, but that the vials shall be poured out upon Antichrist. God may scourge all the Reformed churches before these vials be poured out, and persecution may go through them all, the which I called drops of these vials. But the vials are intended for Antichrist and shall end in the time of Antichrist. And whatsoever becomes of us, yet our children and our children's children shall see the issue of the vials poured out upon the whore of Babylon. This I speak for your comfort. Fifthly, I am to exhort you that you would, all of you, contribute your utmost endeavor to keep the ark of God from being taken. And here I shall show you first what the magistrate should do, second what the minister should do, and third what the people should do. First what the magistrate should do. I shall say but little of this of them because I am not now to speak to them. They are to use their authority for the setting of the ark. For the ark of the covenant will be like the ark of Noah, always floating upon the waters until the magistrates settle it. Thus David in 2 Samuel 6.12 he gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000 to fetch home the ark. So Solomon, he assembled the elders of Israel and the heads of the tribes, the nobles, and the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel to Jerusalem with a great deal of pomp to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord into its place. Oh, that God would encourage our nobles and magistrates that they might be solicitous to settle the ark. Magistrates must not be as the Philistine. They had the ark, but what did they with it? They set it up in the house of Dagon. But Dagon and the ark could never agree. Where false religion comes in at one door, true religion goes out at the other door. You must not put the ark and Dagon together. Secondly, what must the ministers do to keep the ark from losing? They must endeavor after holiness. The ark will never stand steady or nor prosper upon the shoulders of Hophni and Phinehas. A wicked, profane, drunken ministry will never settle the ark. It must be the sober, pious, godly ministers that must do it. How holy must they be that draw nigh to the God of holiness? And thirdly, what must the people of God do that the ark may not be lost? There be five things I shall commend unto you and then commend you to God. First, you must not idolize the ark. Second, you must not undervalue the ark. Third, you must not pry into the ark. And fourth, you must not meddle with the ark without a lawful call. Five, you must keep the covenant of the ark. First, you must not idolize the ark. That was the sin of the people in the text. They thought the very presence of the ark would excuse them and keep them safe. Therefore, they carried the ark into the camp. Though they reformed not and repented not, yet they thought the ark would save them. So many there be that think the ark will save them, though never so wicked. But nothing will secure a nation but repentance and reformation. Secondly, do not undervalue the ark. This was Michal's sin, 2 Samuel 6.14. When David danced before the ark and Michal mocked him and despised him in her heart, but uh, saith he, it was before the Lord. And if this be vile, I will be more vile. Some men begin to say, what need have we any preaching? Will not reading prayers serve Others say, what need so much preaching will not once a day serve? Now, this is to undervalue the ark. Therefore, let us say, as David, if uh, to preach the word, if to fast and pray for the nation, if this be vile, then I will be more vile. Thirdly, we must not pry into the ark. This was the sin of the men of Beth Shemesh. 1 Samuel 6.19 they looked into the ark and God smote them and cut off 50,000 and threescore men be not too curious in searching where God hath not discovered or revealed for example there be great thoughts of a heart when God will deliver his people and set his churches at liberty and many men talk much of the year 1666 that shall be the year when where an antichrist shall be destroyed 
and there are strange impressions upon the hearts of many learned ones as to this year. Some go to the year 1669 and others pitch upon other times, but truly, if you will have my judgment, and I am glad of this opportunity to tell you, this is to pry too much into the ark. Remember the text, Acts 117, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. And thus, to conclude upon my uh, upon any particular time, if you find you are deceived, it is the way to make you atheists, and that afterwards you shall believe nothing. And those ministers do no service, or rather ill service to the church of God, that conclude of the times and seasons. A popish author said that in the year 1000, there was a general belief over the Christian world that the day of judgment should be that year. But when they saw it happened not, they fell into their old sinning again and they, they were worse than before and believed in nothing. Well, God's time is the best and therefore let us not pry too much into the ark. Fourthly, you must not meddle with the ark unless you have a lawful call to meddle with it. This was the sin of Uzi. Second Samuel 6, 6 and 7. The ark was in danger of falling and he being a good man, meaning no hurt, to keep up the ark, took hold of it. But for so doing, he destroyed himself and made a breach and hindered the carrying home of the ark at that time. We have had a great deal of disorder heretofore, and an abundance of well-minded people usurped upon the ministerial office. They were afraid the ark was falling, and therefore they touched the ark. They laid hold on the ark. But their touching the ark hath undone the ark and themselves too. O oh, take heed of touching the ark. Fifthly, if ever you would preserve the ark, then keep the covenant of the ark. Keep the law which the ark preserves. The ark was a place wherein the law was kept, the two tables. Keep the law and God will keep the ark. But if you break the law, you will forfeit the ark. The ark was called the ark of the covenant. Keep covenant with God and God will preserve the ark. But if you break the covenant of the ark, covenant made in baptism and the covenant often renewed in the sacrament, if you break covenant, God will take away the ark. 